So it is with great pleasure that we announced that the 2021 winner of the Society of Ethnobiology Distinguished Ethnobiologist Award is Paul Minnis. Um, Paul is truly deserving of a Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, and uh, we couldn't really think of anyone that would be more deserving for the 2021 award. Uh, just looking at Paul's CV, I was um, not as, as aware of his work as I probably should have been before before he won this award, but seeing his CV and just the amount of contributions he's given to this field are, are immense. Um, in addition to being the sole author of more than 14 books or editor of 14 books, he's penned uh, dozens upon dozens of different book chapters, uh, technical reports, academic journal articles, um, one of the things that I really appreciate about Paul is that he seems to really know that it's his, the work that we do can't just be stuck to academia, that it needs to go beyond that scope. Um, and throughout his career, Paul has given talks, uh, community lectures, more than 170 community lectures um, and academic presentations. And when you look at them, the difference, the, the different types that he's listed um, are just so, so amazing. Um, everything from traditional anthropology and ethnobiology conferences that we have, uh, that we're used to attending, to um, lecturing uh, folks who are part of the Upward Bound program. So really wide range of exposure and really wanting to advocate for for the field of ethnobiology um, and anthropology. So um, just wanted to, I, I guess I'll start by <laughs> go back and say, uh, Dr. Minnis is uh, received his bachelor's at the University of Colorado um, before getting his master's and PhD at the University of Michigan. Uh, Paul is currently a professor emerita of anthropology at the University of Oklahoma, but he lives in Tucson, Arizona now and is a visiting professor at the University of Arizona in their School of Anthropology. Um, in addition to our award, um, Paul served as the SOE president from 1991 to 1993, has been involved in the society for a long time, um, but has also been involved in a lot of other societies and um, has been hardly awarded and deserved, deservedly awarded for um, many different contributions to other societies as well. Um, he has th three times won the Presidential Recognition Award from the Society of American Archaeology in 1995, 2010, and 2011, and was a Sigma Xi Distinguished Lecturer from 2012 to 2014. Um, one of the things that I really liked just kind of preparing uh for things with Paul and um, announcing this award and figuring out what to really share was that Paul continually stays humble and uh, keeps his humility in, in terms of um, knowing that in this field, we're, we're always growing, we're always learning. And uh, one of the things that he really wanted to highlight was an award he got uh, way back <laughs> at the <laughs> university of Colorado archeological school, which is, um, their field school has the flaming asshole award, which he won in 1971. And so that's an award that I'll let him talk a little bit more about, but um, just wanted to also recognize how, how important it is to have humility um, and how much I'm sure that served him well throughout his career. So I'll stop sharing my screen and without further ado, um, Paul Minnis. Well, I'd like to thank Ashley. I bet that she wouldn't mention that last award. And uh, so I really appreciate that she did. You know, it's not hard to be humble when you've won uh, the Flaming Asshole Award for the University of Colorado Field School. Uh, anyway, but I, 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 it's just literally humbling to get the uh, Distinguished Ethnobiologist Award. It's, uh, it's just, it is a recognition that I really, really appreciate. And I get to be called a Debbie now. So I'm really pleased. Um, these, uh, talks tend to be either biographical or topical, and I really want to, um, uh, do three things. I want to, uh, 
and there'll be three parts. The first is just a short little biographical section. Often people are interested how you got interested in ethnobiology because it really is not a um, sort of a standard thing. And then I want to talk a little bit about Society of Ethnobiology. I mean, my first ethnobiology conference, I, I attended the second. So I have a long perspective and I wanted to mention that. And then at the end, I want to talk about in food insecurity, something I've been interested in, how ethnobiologists really, I think, can play an integral part in this. So then they're all random thoughts. What the heck, you know? Okay, let's go for the first slide. You know, how do you learn about ethnobiology? I think most people pick it up probably in high school, in college. You know, it's not something you find in uh, elementary school or whatever. Uh, and, but I have an unusual, little bit different uh, uh, history of that. Let's go next slide. Uh, it started in the <laughs> 1950s with these really crappy. Um, uh, comic books, Turok, Son of Stone, just absolute garbage. It's two Mandan Indians that fall into a valley with dinosaurs. Of course, they don't think they can spell dinosaurs, so they, they call them honkers. Now, this is awfully fuzzy, but let me guarantee you're not missing anything. And so it's kind of awful. Uh, it's absolute fiction. It would be too polite a term for it. But it got me interested in the past. That and it began later on. I got a little more sophisticated. But in the fourth grade, I told my teacher that I wanted to be an archaeologist. And I guess we can um, we can uh, say Turok on a Stone was one of the starts. It's, it's scary. I hope I've gone beyond that. Next. Okay. Ash, okay. Now, well, what about botany? This is my high school in Denver. I really disliked it. It was really right wing. And I just didn't fit in. I wasn't very happy there. But my biology teacher said, hey, you want to be my assistant? And I said, well, why not? Because I had dropped out of band. I hated it. And there's a greenhouse. It's a high school with a greenhouse. And when I first did it, I thought plants, you know, they're not very interesting. They don't move. They just sit in soil. Uh, but I got interested in plants. And so by my penultimate year in high school, I had the ex deep existential crisis of, gee, is it going to be botany or is it going to be archaeology? And then by my senior year, I realized you could put them together in paleoethnobotany. End of existential crisis for my life, kind of early. And then I went off to as an undergraduate, which I went to four schools as an undergraduate for two and a half years, worked full time, went to school full time, got kicked out for an anti-war demonstration. It was crazy. And so as an undergraduate, I really wasn't able to do much with ethnobiology. I just didn't have any time. But when I went to grad school, I was able to focus on it. And it was absolutely nirvana. So probably unlike many of you, I got started very, very early, which the lesson, of course, is there are kids out there who, if we can reach them, might find ethnobiology interesting, who like gardening, who like people, et cetera. And, and so it doesn't have to start with undergraduates as it does with most people. Next. Part two of the biography. You know, I had a, pr uh, a professor uh, who I dearly loved, and he never said it exactly, but he said, don't take yourself or don't take your colleagues personally seriously. Take what you do deeply seriously, your research and your interests, but don't take the people seriously. And in that vein, I have three slides of a career. Next. The inauspicious beginning in the early 1960s, my first excavation, a picture only a mother could like. And they'll probably take the Debbie Award back from me once you see this picture. Next. By the way, I want to say, um, you know, archaeology, like ornithology, has a lot of avocational societies. People are interested in the topic, but then aren't professionals. And there are a lot of us professional archaeologists that got started that way, just like I bet there are a lot of ornithologists that got started that way. And that's one thing that ethnobiology really doesn't have that... Uh, uh, and that's one reason I think that people tend to start later in life. Well, let's fast forward to 1972, the uh, field school where I won the uh, weekly Finding Asshole Award. We were on, this is the crew that I spent most of the time on, the Ute Mountain Ute Reservation, which is right south of Mesa Verde. And um, believe it or not, uh, none of these people ended up in jail. I doubt you'd let your son or daughter date any of them when you saw them. Uh, but three of the people went on to become professionals. It's amazing. You know, there is hope for everybody. That's the lesson from this picture. Uh, but it is a pretty pathetic uh, uh, group, looking group. And I love it for that. Next. Fast forward to 2009, one of my last field seasons in Chihuahua, Mexico, where I spent about the last 20 years doing my research. And you can ask yourself, did it get any better? And so that's that is the uh, that's the career in three slides. Next. 
By the way, one of the ways I can repay you for the uh, the award is to have a very short presentation so you can go have dinner, lunch, breakfast, go sleep, or lift a pint uh, in honor of ethnobiology. You know, as I say, I my first ethnobiology conference was the second in Flagstaff, and I haven't retained, I haven't uh, attended all of them, but I've attended enough over the years that I've seen ethnobiology. And so I thought I'd just spend maybe two minutes talking about sort of a long-term perspective of the Society of Ethnobiology. Its growth in terms of membership has been arithmetic. You know, it grows, but it grows very, very slowly. And I'm not sure why that is, but it does. But there's been exponential growth in what the society does. Because of the people you just saw in the business meeting and others like Dana, it is unbelievable the number of things that the society does on a volunteer basis. It's just un it's incredible. The other organization I've been mostly active in is the Society of American Archaeology, which is probably, what, 14 times larger than ethnobiology. Uh, there are 7,000 members. Uh, the annual operating budget is probably getting close to $2 million dollars. Uh, and they have a full-time staff. I don't know what it is, seven or eight full-time staff people and the executive director, and they do a lot. But if you sort of did it proportionally, ethnobiology is so much more active. It is amazing, and the people who are officers and work in as editors and other aspects need an incredible amount of, of kudos because it's amazing. As I once wrote, uh, for those of us who are uh, somewhat early uh, people in, in the society, and I organized the 6th and actually the 39th, I, I, I'm embarrassed about what we didn't do. I mean, we were real slackers compared to the people. But I think there are actually a couple of reasons uh, for that. Uh, one of them is, at first, the society was often the second or the third conference that people would attend. It wasn't their primary academic focus. And I think, and I, I don't know if this is the case, but I think that for a good core of the people in ethnobiology, the active ones, this is their organization, and they're committed to this organization, so they're willing to put more effort. And that's a really, really good sign, and I think it means that the society will uh, grow in the future. And there are extraordinary people. Not only is there a core, but people are extraordinary. If you look at the uh, transparency and the concern with ethics and uh, moral behavior, it's really impressive. I don't always agree with the points, but it's, it's, a, it's an impressive organization that gets so much done. Look at the number of publications that get done on a volunteer basis alone, basically. And so, frankly, the people who ought to get the uh, Distinguished Ethnobiology Award are all the people who are serving as authors because they are just, uh, it's amazing how much uh, they do. There are a couple other points. Uh, one is, uh, it seems to me, and I haven't done it, it is systematic, uh, but it seems, uh, look at it, but uh, it seems to me archaeology is, is being reduced as, and the, and the past is being reduced, that it's more ethnological. Uh, nowadays than it was in the past. There's nothing wrong with that. A society is what uh, its members do. I just am surprised. If you look at early society, and particularly the early presidents, et cetera, it was heavily archaeologist, and that's not so much the case anymore. That's not a bad thing. That's not a good thing, uh, but it's just something to think about that I think there's a, the, the society's focus has changed uh, ever so slightly. The one thing I, I'm a little concerned about is having been treasurer of the Society of American Archaeology is I think the budget situation, uh, the board should work on it a bit. That's not the major issue. It's not it's not broke. Society's not broke. It's doing amazing things, giving grants and other and running publications. Uh, but I think there is some work that could be done to make uh, the to take the society uh, to the next level. And the next level requires, uh, I think, a stronger budgetary situation. But that's fairly minor. So the society is a, is a spectacular organization, uh, and I, you know, we're we're sort of has beens and passing it on to the next generation, and and it's wonderful to see the next generation not only take the ball but uh, uh, run a touchdown or two when we would maybe get three yards. Okay, so that's all I have to say about the society. It's in good shape. It's amazing, and uh, keep it up. And those of you who aren't members or involved in the society, you might want to think about it. It's a small group. I know there are some people who are, who are archaeological oriented and they really prefer ethnobiology because it's smaller. And if you want a, a good or academic organization where you can have, get involved, where you can have input and learn from really good people, uh, ethnobiology, uh, there is no better society than I know of. So let's go on to the third topic. You know, out of those 
various publications, I have various interests. But one thing that it seems to me has been there is food insecurity. From my very first book in 19... 19- 85, probably most of you weren't even born then, to uh, new lice for ancient extinct crops. And my most recent one, which is a, a really interesting book to write on famine foods. It just came out this month. And, and the reason I want to talk a little bit about this is I think we all kind of know, but I don't think we really understand how important ethnobiological knowledge is for major issues that we're going to be facing in the world whether it be climate change, food insecurity, resource inequality, et cetera. Uh, it's, ethnobiology has incredibly important information to bear on on this. And the one that I find particularly useful is a topic that I never, I didn't start out doing this, but it just, you know, organically grew is the idea of food insecurity and how can ethnobiology fit into that. Let's do the next one. Well, we all know, this is teaching to the choir, that over the last 10,000 years of agriculture, thousands of crops have been cultivated. Tens of thousands of varieties have been developed. And in addition to that, the the knowledge uh, of of edible native plants is truly astounding. I don't know how many, I don't know if anybody has ever tried to estimate. I know the Q has estimated, uh, said there are 28,000 known medicinal plants. And in terms of edible plants, I can't imagine it isn't equal to or even greater. So we're talking, in fact, one person thought that out of the 400,000 species, 300,000 could be eaten by humans. I think that's probably high, but let's say it's only 100,000 plants. I mean, what an amazing heritage. What an amazing gift from our ancestors going back 10 millennia, in fact, more than 10 millennia, that allow us to deal with the future. And when we think that the world right now is so dependent on 12 plants, it's absolutely scary, especially as we're dealing with the uncertainty of climate change. Now, pretty soon all of you can are going to have wonderful banana plantations, so don't worry about it. Okay, next. And not only the plants, but how people use them. I'm focusing on agriculture. This is a Hopi field. And it's a sand dune field. And if you, and it is the most amazing set of technologies to be able to grow. You see that up at the upper part? That's an orchard. I think it's peaches, but I'm not sure. And then there are beans and corn growing in sand dunes. If you're from the Midwest, I mean, my father grew up on a farm in Iowa and his father would look at this and go, huh? What crappy land. But the Hopis have for thousands of years been growing crops and they develop special varieties that grow in sand. And uh, it is an amazing, amazing technology. This is just one example. If you can go to any other place in the world, you can go out to Highland, Papua New Guinea and found, find uh, mound growing uh, where they grow mounds. You know, it's just indigenous peoples have, as farmers in particular, which I'm most interested in, uh, have developed these unbelievable techniques for growing crops. And so it's not only the crops themselves that are important, but also the knowledge on how to grow them that's very, very important. So there's this immense, immense data that ethnobiologists, and this includes archaeological ethnobiologists, as well as people who are working with modern populations. It's just, it's, it's incredible. And this is absolutely essential. Next. People have recognized for a long time, of course, uh, that uh, saving the germplasm of these land races is exceptionally important. And one of the, to me, one of the great heroes of science is Nikolai Vavilov, who most of you are familiar with, who ran the Bureau of Applied Botany in, in at the time was Leningrad, and developed and cataloged and, and collected some of the very largest uh, collections of indigenous varieties. And this goes back, here he is in 1930. And more recently, we know about the Doomsday Seed Vault. That's, but there are lots of other ones. And so there's been a deep concern to get this germplasm and to preserve it and to potentially use it in the future because populations are expanding, climates are changing, water is becoming more scarce, et cetera, et cetera. They're, we're facing uh, real problems and we need as many tools in the toolbox. And it doesn't, frankly, cost much. And nowadays, you don't have to wear a three-piece suit in the Arizona desert. Next. And if you you should read about Vavilov. He's about this is his trips through North America. He did two trips through Central America and North America. And when he was in Tucson, that's that's where that picture was taken. Uh, when I lived in Oklahoma for 30 years and I've tried to find pictures of when he's in Oklahoma City, but I haven't been able to have any luck. Uh, anyway, he 
got a lot of these in, and sent them back. They were curated during the siege of Leningrad where millions of people starved to death. These collections were held sacred. In fact, something like nine, seven or nine of the staff members who were watching these seed collections starved rather than eat these seeds, which they could have. And so these collections are very, very important. Now, there's an ethical issue with biopiracy. And I'm not going to argue against that. That's very, very important. But I think we need to think that you know, what was what Vavilov doing? Was that biopiracy? And I, I don't think, I wouldn't think about that. Think about the context. That was 1930 and, uh, to 1934. And what was happening in the Soviet Union at the time? Well, there was the Ukrainian Holomador, where between three and a half and seven and a half million people starved to death. The Kazakh famine of 1932 to 1933 killed one and a half million Kazakhs. In the uh, North Caucasus and uh, in uh, the upper Volga, between two or three million people died starving. And so there was a really valuable role that uh, Vavilov and other plant explorers did. They were maybe exploiting, and you could argue we're doing bio prospecting, but there was a damn good reason for it. Now, I must say a lot of those deaths were due to Stalin being a, a, an a-hole. I mean, the, some of the, uh, uh, they, the, some of the um, political processes led to a lot of those deaths, but they had an enormous amount of starvation. By the way, we don't ever learn, any, learn anything during Mao's Great Leaf Forward somewhere between 30 and between 15 and 33 million people died in 1959 to 1962 for the same reason. So sometimes we don't learn. So anyway, I think when we look at uh, this early uh, collecting, uh, it may be, you could call it biopiracy or bioprospecting, but you know, there are reasons for it and it wasn't as, um, as exploitative as, as it is nowadays. Next. So next, we have the issue of here is the Society Ethnobiology webpage, and they talk about uh, trans, the legacy of, of transcolonial uh, biocolonials and biopiracy. And uh, I understand that, and it is a big problem. Uh, but I think uh, for many of these, especially the early explorers, uh, they actually did it for very good reasons. You know, uh, next. The big problem nowadays is we have evil man Monsanto and uh, other organizations where they can patent life forms and use this information to make money. That's where I think it's different from somebody like Vavilov who wanted to feed Russian peasants. And Monsanto wants to feed its shareholders. And so the question of biopiracy and bioprospecting nowadays is obviously much different uh, than it was in the past. And we have to be very, very careful. And we have to help protect intellectual property rights of indigenous peoples. There's no question about that. Next. And so here's a, a statement uh, from the International Society of Ethnobiology. And, and the red in red is the support community driven development of indigenous peoples, cultures and languages. And contrast that to the next knowledge indigenous cultures, cultural and intellectual property rights. Those are absolutely correct. The problem, it seems to me, that's a little more complicated is where that semicolon is between the two. That's where it becomes a problem. Because what I'm going to suggest is the transfer of biological crops and knowledge of plants is has been and likely will continue to be an absolutely essential uh, thing, uh, uh, activity for keeping people alive in these today and in the future. And so putting these two together in a way that is fair, but also helps people is, is not easy. Let me give you a couple of examples. Next. Let's go to my favorite place, the distant past. Next. And let's look at uh, what our colleagues working in Eastern North America found. And I'm envious of the quality of work that paleoethnobotanists in Eastern North America have done. Now, when we think of farmers in Eastern North, indigenous farmers, we think of the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash. And they developed varieties, but ultimately these plants came from Mesoamerica. They moved from Mesoamerica up into North America, and they were not original from 
uh, North America, although people developed their own, uh, their own varieties. And before that, before about 900 AD or something, uh, uh, there were a whole series of plants, native plants that had been domesticated that we didn't know about until the archaeologists found it. And this brings up a tangent. And the bottom slide is Iva annua macrocarpa, gloriously named sumpweed or marsh elder. Uh, you can you can barely see it there, but if I got a close up, it wouldn't be any prettier. But this we can demo, our, uh, I, my colleagues in East North America have demonstrated over thousands of years the domestication of this prop, crop. It's in the sunflower family. It's an oily seed. And one thing to ask is, as an archaeologist, is how many of these crops are there that were domesticated in the past that, for whatever reason, were lost? And could they be a part of the solution for the future? I don't know, uh, but it doesn't take much to know uh, whether, to know about these things. Can they be redomesticated, for example? Then you've got the ethical issue is the Iva annual macrocarpa. Who owns it? If it, in fact, was redomesticated, does Monsanto get to do it? Or is it the descendants of indigenous peoples in the southeast United States and the Midwest who, uh, who uh, develop this? Is it lost property by law or is there something else? Now, this hasn't been an issue. I've raised this years ago and nobody paid any attention because I don't. it hasn't come up yet. But it's a, it's a side issue that's fairly important because I think there are literally probably hundreds of crops that were domesticated that for a variety of reasons uh, became extinct. And as I say, we not only have to gather land races and germplasm of extant uh, uh, crops, especially on unusual crops, but why, what about the ones in the past that were domesticated that no longer are? Next. And following on that tangent where I work in the southwest and northwest Mexico, let's put agave or the um, uh, century plant. Colleagues of mine, Paul and Susie Fish in particular, have demonstrated something. They learned something fairly new. The top picture is a map in 1906 of Phoenix, Arizona. And those canals are, in fact, ancient canals, incredible canal system, hundreds of miles of these really amazing canals. And Phoenix is called Phoenix because it was built on. It was a Phoenix bird rising out of a previous ancient city. And they were doing corn and beans, squash and cotton. Uh, and what the, our friends, the fishes and their colleagues found is in the upland areas, there are these agaves that were cultivated. And in fact, that's a guy named Glenn Rice who's looking at either agave delamatriae or agave murphy. I don't remember which. And that is actually a relic ancient agave that over 600 years has the plants itself has. They all die, but they keep cloning. And that's probably a relic population. Uh, Wendy Hodgkins, who is a botanist and is... Um, the leading expert on agaves in Arizona, I think there are about eight species of agaves that, in fact, were ancient cultivars that we never knew about. Everybody thought with these big, these big uh, irrigated fields that that's what the people ate. But the fishes have found in one mountain uh, 50,000 of these agave plots, and which we didn't know about. And here we, here, here we have a crop uh, that, again, nobody knew about, really. There's agaves. There are other species that are cultivated in Mexico, but these, what people thought were native agaves, turn out really not to be. Next. Now, that's all the past. Let's look at the present and how knowledge is fairly important, I think, the transfer of knowledge, how to do it ethically, but it's absolutely essential that knowledge that we that people have be shared. And I think most indigenous people are happy to share as long as they aren't screwed by companies trying to make money off of it. And I've only got, I think, two more slides, and I want to give two examples which, to me, are striking about the knowledge of famine foods. Next. Well, three slides. One of my favorite books ever written is Yawan, the Zhuang Ben Cao. My sorry for the pronunciation. This was published in the late 1400s, and it's a list of 414 famine foods. Uh, and the Chinese uh, has been reprinted recently, and there's a really obscure English translation. And so people have been interested in famine foods for a very long time, and but not systematically very much. Uh, there are botanists who've done reports, and there are social scientists who've done narratives, uh, but there's not much systematic on it. But the Zhuang Ben Cao uh, gives a kind of a model of the kind of information that's available. And I think they focused actually on only on one province in China. Next. If you live in North America, East Western North America in particular, you know this plant. 
puncture vine or goat's head. It's considered most, one of the most loathsome plants. It's sort of like the mosquito of the plant world. It has these very, uh, the fruits have these really stiff, uh, long uh, spines. And if you walk a dog or ride a bicycle or, uh, uh, you know, like walking barefoot, you know this plant very well. Uh, the person who wrote Weeds of Arizona said, this is the plant that people hate more than any other plant. But I think most of us who live where goat's head is, and I ride a bicycle a lot, and I'm not a great fan of goat's head, would be amazed and surprised that this has been a major famine food that has probably saved tens of thousands of lives over history, if not more, in both India and in West Africa. You can take the fruits and you can grind them up into like a flour. Uh, they really have, the fruits don't really have much uh, nutritional value, but evidently the plant itself, the greens, is incredibly nutritious. Who would have thought? And so here's knowledge that some people have that other people don't have. Let's go to the next and last slide, I think. Kudzu, if you're from the southeast, uh, you know how wonderful kudzu is. It's an, uh, it's an invasive, from, originally from Japan, that likes to devour trees and buildings and everything else. It's an absolutely horrible, invasive plant. And people who have kudzu and try to spend all the time might be really surprised to know that the roots have been a major a for, important famine food in Papua New Guinea. We didn't know that. I wouldn't have known it. And so the cross-cultural knowledge, as well as transferring plants, but this cross-cultural knowledge can be helpful. And it's even within an area. One thing that surprised me in writing the Famine Food book, there are a number of case studies of neighboring villages that have very different knowledge of what is a famine food, what's edible, when, not, when the normal rations are, rations are not edible. And if that happens within just neighboring villages, just think about like kudzu or uh, goat's head, uh, invasives that are going to cross uh, continents. All of this knowledge may be irrelevant, may not be useful, but it doesn't cost much to collect and it may keep people alive. You know, you figure how much Hubble costs or all this uh, astronomy and God bless them is really cool stuff. But basically ethnobiology probably costs what a match costs to start the, the rocket engines on a launch. I mean, we're really, we work cheap folks. And the information can be very, very valuable and very, very useful. We just have to do it and understand and make sure we understand how this knowledge can be transferred in an ethical way, but it's absolutely essential from the past to the present. And I would argue into the future with climatic uncertainty that this knowledge needs to be broadly based and has, needs to be shared. It saves lives. It has in the past and, and it may now and it will likely into the future. And, and so... Ethnobiology is really important. We know it is, but I think we don't know really enough. And, and so we need to keep double downing, doubling, doubling down on our research and realize that even if it seems sort of obscure to a lot of people, uh, it really isn't obscure to helping save humanity. And I believe that's it. Thank you, Mil Gracias, for the award and your attention. Uh